recently a graduate student in our uh, program at Cedar sinai and for one of his capstone projects, he focused on using virtual reality uh, in our infusion center. And so today, we're going to hear some data from both of them about their experiences using virtual reality for pain and anxiety in patients with cancer. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Brian Minton. Uh, as Dr. Spiegel said, I work here in the uh, Cancer Center in clinical research. Um, so uh, a little bit of background. Uh, so about 39.5% of people will get a cancer diagnosis at some point in their lives. Um, anxiety is very prevalent. Um, about 90% with symptoms, approximately 19% with a clinical diagnosis across cancer types. Um, anxiety and also pain, uh, both prevalent in cancer and they have adverse effects on quality of life and cancer care outcomes. So uh, first for my project, so as uh, Dr. Spiegel said, I um, completed the Master's in Health Delivery Science program. Uh, about this time last year, I was executing my capstone project. So as a clinical research coordinator in the Cancer Center, I um, spent a lot of time with cancer patients in the Infusion Center. This here's an image from our Infusion Center just a block away. Um, Infusion appointments can be frequent, they can be long, um, and they can be anxiety-inducing. Uh, you know, patients, depending on the chemotherapy regimen they're, regimen they're on, they could be coming once, twice a week. Uh, they could be there for two hours, anywhere to six even more hours. Um, so I was interested in seeing what uh, giving these patients the opportunity to use virtual reality might do as far as their anxiety levels during their appointments and just whether they enjoyed the experience. Um, so my project was a pilot study um, to see, or, or pilot, uh, it was a quality improvement project rather, um, to see if it was feasible to have a clinical service available in the cancer center. It's already offered to patients during chemo at some cancer centers in the US, um, Marie Yeager and Helen F. Graham at, at least. Um, and research suggests that maybe a beneficial intervention for decreasing symptoms of anxiety in cancer patients. Um, so some background on um, what VR is, uh, some work that has been done in VR and cancer. It's been shown to be feasible and enjoyable and useful. In addition to anxiety, it's also been shown to improve depression, levels of happiness, quality of life scores, um, physical discomfort. Um, there was a study of patients with end-stage cancer receiving palliative care, and it found that uh, VR could reduce their pain by 50% and also improve their fatigue, depression, anxiety, and well-being. Um, and as will be touched on a little bit more by Dr. Irwin in a few minutes, um, it may help reduce need for opiate an analgesics and the issues that arise by their use. So my pilot um, focused on anxiety and also just the overall patient experience in the infusion center. Um, it was a convenient sample. So um, 31 patients overall were given the opportunity to use the virtual reality headsets. Um, this work was done in collaboration with social work, nursing, and the Cedar sinai virtual medicine program. Um, so I would approach infusion nurses and social workers as well to see if they had any patients who might be interested in trying out the VR and who they felt might benefit from it. The program we used was called VR Solace. It was um, programmed right here at Cedar sinai by Dr. Omer Loran. Um, there are some images here. Um, there are computer-generated environment images. There are a total of eight scenes that patients could choose from. Um, the forest, outer space, and uh, this desert are three examples. There was also underwater, um, a peaceful lake, a beach. Um, patients could just enjoy the environment with some relaxing music, or if they wished, there was the option to do a guided meditation or a breathing exercise. Um, so the information I was interested in collecting, um, anxiety scores, and for that we used the state trait anxiety inventory uh, short form. So this was the version that has six questions. This was actually embedded within the software. So before the patient even got to the main menu to choose their scene, the uh, questionnaire would pop up and they would just choose the um, answer purely hands-free, just um, focus-based. So they would just have to focus on the answer of choice and uh, focus on it for several seconds. At the end of their experience, and they were allowed to use the VR for however long during their visit they wanted to, um, then I would just uh, collect the headset from them and ask them some questions about their experience, whether they enjoyed it, what they liked about it, um, whether 
the kinds of feelings that it elicited in them, whether they felt it would be a useful and um, service to be offered and whether they would want to use it again in the future. Um, so before I go over the results, just a little bit of information about the patient demographics. Um, so it was a pretty evenly uh, split between male and female, um, wide range of ages, um, also a wide range of cancer types, um, including two patients with uh, non-cancer blood disorders who were both um, still getting treated in the cancer center, center still getting infusions, so we decided um, to still include them since this is all about testing out this as a p potential clinical service for just anyone who's um, receiving infusions in the cancer center. Um, so overall, the state trading anxiety inventory, um, so we did a two-tailed t-test, um, found a significant difference pre and post. So pre, as I said, the questionnaire came up right when they booted up the software. Post, after they had used it for at least seven minutes and then went back to the main menu, they would see the questionnaire again and they would be asked the same questions. Um, so this was very promising. It showed that their anxiety did in fact decrease. Um, I also looked at, um, I wanted qualitative feedback, and these were some of the themes that tended to come up. So over, overwhelmingly positive, um, escapism, relaxation, desire to use again, all these themes came up again and again. Um, my favorite quotes there at the top, uh, the best I've ever seen in my life, and I'm 83 years old. Uh, a lot of these patients had never used VR before. Uh, they weren't familiar with it at all, and they were just blown away. Um, the only criticism that ever came up was they wanted more, like better resolution, more realism. And so since then, um, we've been improving the uh, software even more to, to provide that to patients. I also asked several of the providers, the infusion nurses, infusion nurses what they thought, because you know I want to make sure that we're making their job easier, not harder. Um, and their feedback was positive as well. They didn't feel it was disruptive. They appreciated that it gave patients a distraction. Um, key, key considerations that were identified even before I started collecting the data because I wanted to make sure we were not disruptive. Communication and just the amount of time that um, the infusion nurses have to do their duties has to be taken into account. Um, so we wanted to determine the best times to approach the patients with the VR and we wanted to make sure that the nurses and the patient communicate as far as um, the best way to get the patient's attention if they need to, um, the nurse needs something from them while they're in the VR environment. Um, and then this is the study team that helped out on this project. Uh, Dr. Irwin, who we'll hear from in just a moment. Dr. Laurent, Dr. Spiegel. Um, J.K. Vandergog was the um, manager of the social work department at the time. Um, Josh and Sophia were um, from the VR team. So thank you everybody for that, um, for all your help in the project. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Irwin, who's going to talk about um, the ongoing randomized controlled trial. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. I'd particularly like the talk by Dr. Lacey. I felt like I was at a psychiatry conference. Um, almost felt like I should have been up there with him too. And I'm glad you put hypnotherapy up there. I, I trained in hypnotherapy a long time ago. I haven't really done it lately. But when I first started talking about this with Dr. Spiegel and Dr. Laurent, I actually think the underlying mechanisms are the same. Um, the arm, as you said, might be easier to administer. Um, but I do wonder if they work the same. So I'm going to talk about our uh, randomized trial uh, that we were fortunate to get funded by NCI. Dr. Spiegel's the, the co-PI, and uh, we've been talking about doing something. This, this has been going on for a couple of years now, but about five years ago when Brennan started doing this work, I said, hey, I have a captive audience for you. They sit there for hours. What better um, population to, to do this in? And so some of that is what, how Brian's work came about as well. Let me see which button it is. All right, so we're going to talk about a randomized control trial for virtually adding uh, GI cancer pain, uh, improving patient-reported outcomes. No, not that button. Oh, that went backwards. Oh, got it. Here we go. I think I was pressing the laser. All right. Four of 10 leading causes of cancer mortality are in GI malignancies. 73% of patients with GI malignancies have abdominal pain from several etiologies. The experience can be severe, unremitting, and of course impacts all the things we've heard about already, quality of life, nutrition, physical, activity, anxiety, uh, quality of life, et cetera. And of course, as why we're all here today, VR has emerged as promising treatment for this. So this is the trial overview. Um, we're looking at 360 patients divided evenly among three groups. We have a non-immersive sham arm, an immersive distraction arm, and an immersive skill-based arm, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. The objective is to look at um, 
the impact on pain at 30 days um, and uh, using the Promise GI belly pain uh, scale. So this is the immersive-based, um, skills-based VR. It's multimodal, um, pain care VR, also by uh, our friends at Applied VR and also our colleague who's also on the grant, um, Dr. Beth Darnell, and that was her speaking about CBT to patients. Um, and then this is a, a look at uh, an activity where patients try to focus their attention on something other than pain. So it's a bunch of modules focused on psychoeducation, pain education, breathing training, relaxation training, executive functioning, CBT. Um, this is the Immersive Distraction VR uh, program by Dr. Laurent. It's a library of about 20, 360 degree 3D interactive VR experiences known to provide pain reduction studied by the team here at Cedars. And they're about four to 10 minutes each. And then in the sham arm, it's the same videos with the same music, but they're 2D, non-interactive, same headsets, neutral videos um, uh, as a control. So we have a lot of exploratory outcomes as well. Belly pain, pain interference, coping, social isolation, uh, steps. Uh, so Jillian's here helping us uh, with that part. Um, sleep as well. And we also want to look at the dosage amount of VR used and compare that to the outcomes too. So we can look at how, which modules they used, how much time over how many days, et cetera, and get a sense of um, if there's a dose response curve as well. So this is the schema for the study. Um, we pre-screen patients, so they go through a screener week and then they're randomized um, to the three arms. Um, we do a technical onboarding call with them because uh, you can do this whole study remotely. We mail them the VR headsets. Uh, we can do the consent and everything um, uh, over the phone. Um, and then they mail them back and we've gotten most of them back. Uh, I think a few have gone missing, but we've gotten most of them back. So we could do this completely virtually, which really helped during uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, we are looking at the 30-day outcome, but we are also asking questionnaires up to 60 days to see if there's, a, uh, if, if the, um, there's an enduring response after 30 days of being without it. Uh, so final assessments at 60 days. Um, and unfortunately, this is all the data I have to show you because we're still in the middle of recruiting. Uh, I don't really give talks without showing data and results. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'm not used to it. But, um, but just to show you, we've um, administered the GI Promise as a screener to uh, about 550 patients. And one of the things we're working on, if you look at the red column on the right, is 257 of those expired, meaning patients didn't respond. And so we're now focusing on how we convert those more to the uh, people responding. And of those uh, other 250 or so that did respond, about 173 were found to be eligible. And of those, 112 signed a consent. That's not too bad. And um, sorry, 112 agreed to get consented and 100 got a consent. And we were able to randomize 82 of those. So we're you know, about a third of the way through our recruitment, a little bit behind schedule, but not too bad. And in the cancer world, actually, we're way ahead of schedule because those tend to, it's hard to do research in cancer patients. So um, we hope to have data for you. I don't know if we'll have it for next year's conference. Um, but hopefully soon. So just in summary, uh, for uh, Brian's part, you know, VR infusions uh, during infusion visits are a promising service. They enjoy the headsets and many report feelings of relaxation. Uh, the staff really like it too. We get feedback all the time. I think it makes their job easier. Um, anxiety, sky, anxiety scores decrease and the providers, as I said, are supportive of it and it's not um, disruptive. And then we have this randomized control trial uh, that um, it looks like it's feasible and safe. Uh, we're able to accrue to it, and uh, we hope to have data and outcomes for you in the near future. So um, our next steps is trying to expand that infusion pilot and explore options for clinical staffing. That's the rub is who's going to administer this and run around the infusion center, handing it out, making sure the headsets are collected and cleaned uh, and not getting in the in nurse's way. Uh, we we got to improve and finish our recruitment uh, and analyze the results and disseminate, as I just said. Plan future uh, studies based on those results. We have a lot of secondary outcomes to look at that could be followed up. And of course, the most important thing is continue to improve care and outcomes for 
uh, all patients, not just patients with cancer, but, but particularly in my case, patients with cancer, because that's my job. So as Brian said, it takes a team. There's a whole lot of people, um, particularly my co-PI uh, and colleague, Dr. Spiegel. Uh, Dr. Hendafar has really led the charge as one of our GI oncologists. And, and Dr. Gong and Asipov also, who are GI oncologists. Dr. Laron, who is instrumental in, in all of the technology behind this. And we also have a uh, colleague at Emory who's helping recruit for the study as well. Um, a big coordination team, um, all uh, in, in Brennan's lab, uh, with a little bit of help from some cancer center folks uh, and data support staff. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me here today.